Remarkable Instances and Modern Miracles Through Prayer and Faith by C. G. Bevington Forward. After much prayer, I have finally concluded to make another effort at setting forth some instances of my life, incidents that have been of great importance to me, and will be to those directly or indirectly touched by them. I hope that each one reading these incidents will read carefully this forward, as it contains a few useful key to the book, for as soon as I ventured out from the mission work in Cincinnati, where I had spent several years, I began to realize that mine was not a featherbed vocation. God had called me to labor amongst the poorest of the people, but few of whom ever entered the church. So, from the start, mine was a life entirely of faith. I never took up an offering for myself, nor asked anyone else to, nor made my wants known, only to God. I never had any objections to those who did take up offerings, but as for me, I never could. Often I thought I would, but when I reached the platform, well, I took an inventory of the crowd, and I said to myself, well, there's Brother Jones. He has that large family and is not too well. Uh, his little place is not paid for, so I couldn't expect any, him to give anything. And well, Next is Brother Smith. And he lost a cow just last week, and of course he couldn't spare anything. And well, Next is Sister Bell with those four children to f care for, and she couldn't give anything uh, and Brother Brown has seven mouths to feed and backs to clothe. And his horse got hurt last week. And he had to hire a horse, so of course he couldn't give anything. So I went all over the congregation and excused everyone. <laughs> Hence it was a work of trusting God, all of which has enabled me to ferret out many cases that otherwise would have been turned down, overlooked, or classed as impossible. So... As these instances occurred, I became impressed with their significance. I got a large book, and when I would come in for a little rest, I would write down the important incidents as a stimulus to my faith. Many a time, after coming in from a very hard pull, without money, and but little visible results, and feeling not the best, I dived into that book and invariably was greatly encouraged. Several times, when I was getting pretty low in faith, the records in that book lifted the clouds and gave me great victory, knowing that when God had done once, he could do again. If conditions were met, I generally kept a pretty close watch on the conditions to see that they were up to the standard. Then, as several people got hold of these records, they insisted that I put them in a book form. <laughs> that was so far from my idea and ability that I paid little attention to it. Others kept at me, but until I did manage to bring the matter before God. At first, I received great encouragement and mentioned it to my father, and until I had just to say, yes. But I had no money to live on while writing the book, nor any typewriter, and the publishers wanted it typewritten. So I dropped the matter, but the Lord kept at me, and soon the way was opened up for me to get a typewriter through Reverend John Fleming. Well, one obstacle was removed, uh, but still another, equally as large, confronted me. Lack of money to write the book. It was not long until I was invited over from Ironton, Ohio, to Ashley, Kentucky, and I preached in the Ashland Heights Church Saturday and Sunday. I was invited to the home of dear brother and sister Simpson. On Monday, Sister Simpson said, Brother Brevington, here we have a house full of children, and husband is away all day, and I have so much work to do that I am not caring for the children as I ought to. So we believe that God wants you in our house to live before these children. After I had prayed over the matter, it seemed quite clear that I should stay with them. Then I began writing. But when about half done, I got tired of such confinement and went out for a few meetings. In the meantime, Brother um, Fleming and John... Fleming and his brother and wanted me to come out to his house then in Willard, Kentucky and finish my book. This I did, but before the book was entirely finished, I was called out in meetings. Thinking that I would have a rest sometime, which would enable me to finish it, I just went along that way, wanting for a more favorable opportunity, until I guess the Lord got tired of my waiting and the book was burned up with all else that I had while I was living at Rush, Kentucky. The object in writing this forward is to give a reason for the absence of names and dates. I drew my manuscript from the book of records, which was burned. 
I had given up all idea of rewriting. But through the past winter and this spring, several told me that I ought to rewrite the story of my life. Others have written me, some who knew nothing of the former book, and of the late dear brother Haynes of Kingswood, Kentucky, had importuned me to write. So I related to him all that I had said here relative to my first book, and told him that I had no record of names, dates, or places. He said, they are of little importance in such a work as this. So, after praying it over, I concluded to rewrite the instances. Read as impartially as you can, for all that follows is true. I hope that these incidents will be as great a blessing to you and others as they have been to me. If they are, pass the book on, keep it traveling, and hence spreading the deeper truths of the hidden nuggets contained in God's great gold mine, the Bible. Read, pray, lay hold, take in and give out, eat and get fat. G. C. Bevington Introduction It gives us very great pleasure to commend to the reading public this little volume, which was conceived in prayer and brought forth from one of the most consecrated lives we have ever known. We have known Brother Brevington for fifteen years and have always found him the same true, loyal, prayerful, a holy and devout Christian, with a burden for a lost and dying world. Since the days of George Mueller, we doubt if there has been a man who has prayed more, had more direct answers to prayer, and witnessed more remarkable cases of divine healing than has the author of this book. We bespeak of it a very wide circulation, and heartily commend it to all the lovers of deep spiritual things. John and Bona Fleming Number 1. A Sketch of My Beginnings Now, to my starting point. You see, my name is Bevington, and that was my father's and mother's name. I suppose that is why I have carried that long name more than 74 years. My father was a Methodist preacher, and they said he was a rattler too. I have been told that he made men's hairs stand straight on their heads. He was especially led to preach on hell. He preached to the Indians in Wyandotte County, Ohio, and the adjoining counties, and built log churches and schoolhouses. This was all before I made an appearance in the arena. When I came on the scene, he was filling the place of a backslider, carrying on blacksmithing, wagon making, and carpeting at Little Sandusky, Ohio. He had backslidden over a barrel of soap. So you see that Satan can use most anything to get a preacher to backslide. But mother held on to her God and had prayer with us children, all of while had much to do in afterlife, in our finding God and keeping him. The most beautiful features of her life were never seen until she was gone. Then they seemed to stand out on every corner or crossroads as signboards pointing to the right direction. Now, you may wonder how father came to backslide over a barrel of soap. <laughs> well, it was... <laughs> Uh, over it and not in it. <laughs> now he got into it, especially head first. There might be some logical conclusion as to how he backslid. Further, Father, as I stated, built churches and schoolhouses where the people were too poor to do so and took pledges from them as payment on the church, such as meat, corn, wheat, potatoes, etc. And one man promised him a barrel of soap. Of course, Father expected the soap. But the man never delivered it. Father, soon after that, settled in Little Sandusky, seven miles from Upper Sandusky in Wyandotte County, Ohio, and so did this member who had promised him the soap. Well, Father preached there, and when this man had run as long as he thought he ought to, he demanded that this man be put out of the church, as he was the liar, as he called him. He concluded that if the man was not fit for heaven, he was not fit to be a member of his church. But he was then a good paying member and a class leader. So they voted with great, uh, quite a majority to let him remain. So father handed in his resignation and never went to church again. And of course, he backslid. But our home was a preacher's home as long as the preacher did as he, they agreed. When they came there, I suppose everyone said, Well, he is an old friend of mine and I will go and get him back into the church. I well remember being in the shop one day when the preacher who was conducting the quarterly meeting Saturday and over Sunday came up there to draw Father over to the church. He was using quite tempting bait, as it seemed to me, but finally Father got tired of it and said, This whole thing, 
thing reminds me of an incident that occurred when I was a boy. We had a neighbor, a farmer, who had three sons and two daughters, all married but one, and he was considered quite foolish. He never went to school. After the father and mother were laid beneath the sod, these children concluded to divide the property and the stock. Jim was so weak-minded that he thought they could easily dope him, especially on the stock line. They had a lot of sheep, and as usual, quite a number of poor, bony, scrawny one, old ones. Then they said, now Jim has that pet sheep of his that he has raised, and of course would not part with it. So let us take all the poor sheep and put them in a pen, and put his pet with them, and then put the others in pens, and tell Jim to go ahead and take his choice. They supposed, of course, that he would take the pen his pet sheep was in. So Jim went out and looked at them all, and the last pen was the one where his pet was. As he looked over the fence and saw his dear pet in there, he said, Mickey, we have been together for three years, eating out of the same dish, drinking out of the same pond, and sleeping in the same bed. We have had many good times together, but Mickey, you have gotten in such bad company that we have to part. So Jim selected a pen of the choicest sheep. Father said, this is the condition here. Bad company and we can't fellowship. We part as Jim and Mickey did. How father would laugh as he told us that. And they never got him back in that church, nor in any other. Though I hope that he got back to the Lord. So you see, Satan has pretty reasonable excuses viewed from a backslider's angle. The only hope for me is to keep in the middle of the road and never backslide. Then Satan can't get a hold of me. Now, back again. I was born quite unhealthy and never went to school until I was 10 years old. I had a disease that baffled all physicians. Father, having a drugstore in connection with his other work, had studied medicine some and concluded to take me out to an uncle who lived in Indiana and had a tamarack swamp. The chewing of the tamarack gum would cure me. So mother fixed me up when I was 13 years of age, and I went out there and chewed and chewed that gum. And sure enough, it cured me in less than a year. Then I got strong and hearty. Father had a rule that I considered quite unreasonable, as boys often think, that they know more than their parents. I got so strong that I said that I would fool him. He would never come that racket on me. That he had come on the other boys, I thought. So I foolishly ran off with my uncles from there and went to Michigan. Now, comes the point that has led me to write this part. As mother's life and her family prayers had made an indelible impression on me and I could not get away from it. On Sunday morning, Christmas, 59 years ago, I started down the pike at 11.30 p.m. to walk to Kendonville, Indiana. A distance of some 15 to 20 miles. The snow was nearly knee deep and I had a pair of overalls and one shirt wrapped up in an old fashioned colored handkerchief which con constituted my wardrobe and suitcase. I had washed sheep the spring before for a neighbor and received a dollar twenty five for it and had kept that even over the 4th of July and all winter and fall. Yep, I arrived at Kenderville about daylight and found a train was going to Elkhart shortly. I purchased a ticket for Elkhart and arrived there about 8 a.m. Hungry as a bear, I slipped into an alley to see how much money I had and found that I had 45 cents. I had to go a little slow as I had then 16 miles to go to Edwardsburg and then 12 miles to Calipolis. But I must have something to eat. I went to the grocery and got some bologna and cheese. I will never forget what a picture I presented with a hunk of cheese in one hand and a piece of bologna in the other and my suitcase under my arm. There I was, stalking down the principal street of Elkhart, the largest town I had ever been in, and oh, the sights and the windows and the busy folks running here and there were all so new to me that I would find myself standing, gaping at, after sights, chewing my cheese and bologna, holding fast to them as a laughable sight in, by the, to the passerbyers. Finally, I was accosted by, well, hello, bud. That was the name somebody called out at my uncle's. My name, Guy, was hard to remember, so Bud was the name that I mostly went by. And now I was terribly frightened to hear that name. I never stopped to see who called it, but struck out up the street on a run, supposing that someone had gotten on my track and followed me that far to take me back. It ran like a trooper, 
But the man hollered and said, I won't hurt you, and came after me. And with the help of some others, he got me headed off and rounded up with the cheese and bologna and suitcase and finally got me to go back with him. After convincing me that he never saw nor heard of me before, he saw that I was cold and no doubt hungry and wanted to take me into his home as he saw that I was a stranger to the sights of Elkhart. I went through a hall a way back and into the kitchen where the good wife was eating breakfast. He said, Oh, Mama, here is our boy. I just found him. She came over and took my cap, brushed my hair, and even kissed me. Well, that kiss, as I had not had one since I left home a year before, broke me all up. But I was so bashful and shy that I could not show any appreciation for her motherly affection. I could not stand it to be in that strange house, though she had relieved me of my cheese and bologna and red suitcase, and both had tried to relieve me of the embarrassment under which I saw I was suffering. She had me eat a good breakfast, and then I spied the wood box as being about empty, and I asked permission to fill it, anxious to get out from under the terrible strain. So he showed me the wood house. I saw and split the wood until they came out and asked me to come in for lunch about 9 a.m., but I never could go into that nice fine kitchen and sit down to their nice table as I was a perfect stranger. So I began to beg off to press excuses as people did of old. Pretty soon the man hollered, Oh, Mary. I wondered who Mary was. And soon I saw, bounding and laughing and smiling, a rosy-cheeked, plump girl about my size and age. And she just took hold of me and hugged me and kissed me and said, You will come in, for we all love you. So she soon got me started. But I was wondering what in the world had made them love me, as no one but mother had ever used that expression. And I knew that she was my mother, and she wasn't actually, but I stumbled in and tucked in, being finally persuaded by Mary, who said, Now I am your sister, and you are my brother. Now come in and sit down right here by me, and Mama will give us some fine buckwheat cakes and maple syrup. Well, the cakes and Mary were quite inviting, but oh, if I had only had the cakes and syrup out in the woodhouse. But now here I was, and what could I do? Some fine linen was on the table, and silverware, forks, and knives, something we had never seen or heard of. Somehow I managed to eat some as Mary cut it up for me, and was so nice. But I was suffering untold agony, as boys these days are further advanced at eight years than I was at fifteen. As soon as I could, I got up, but not till I had blundered out what mother had taught me. Excuse me. I went out to the wood house and brought up some wood until I had piled it away up in the box. Then I saw that water bucket was empty, and I filled it and that in the tea kettle. Now, all this mother had drilled into me, and I have always found it to be so helpful. As in a few years that I had been out in the work, I had gotten into home into homes and the whole meetings that others just could not get into just because I could chop up some wood and carry water and help some. They let me in for the work I would do and that gave me a chance to preach the gospel to them and they had never heard as they had been brought up in the meeting house crumbs and had never had a square meal given to them. It pays to be prepared for almost anything to win the people. Well, back to this home again as I want you to see what a praying mother can do. Though my mother did not know at the time but what I was at my uncle's as any boy should have been. Her prayers were not confined to Noble County, Indiana, but to me, and that meant whatever, wherever I was. Glory to God, I am sure that I leaped the bounds of that home with my uncle and followed me closely every step I took as you will see and be convinced that God hears my mother's prayers. Amen and amen. Oh, how I praise God for a praying mother. I kept on sawing wood all day and had many thoughts. I had not been told uh, them who I was nor where I had come from. They had tried every conceivable, conceivable scheme to find out, but I just would not tell them, as I was afraid it was a scheme to get me back to my uncle's. When evening came, I was pretty homesick and was intending to crawl in back of the large cook stove and curl up for a nap. But soon in bounded Mary from school, and the first thing she cried, Oh, where is my brother, my twin brother? Where is he? 
She soon grabbed me by the shoes and pulled me out of there and out into the yard to play ball. When supper was called, I mustered up courage to go in without so much persuasion. But as soon as supper was over, I was in behind the stove again. As soon as the dishes were washed, here came Mary taking me by the feet and getting me out again. And the first thing I knew, I was in the parlor singing with some, with some of her good old Sunday school songs that mother had taught me. And soon I was crying. Mary soon discovered that and changed tactics on me and got me interested in the picture book. Then, after the next thing, I realized she was pumped me entirely dry. She got my first name, my last name, and where I'd come from and where my people lived. That man, then, though not a Christian, wanted me to go back to my uncle, but I refused. First, because I was afraid to go back. Secondly, because I had no money to go back. He said, maybe you do not have money enough to take you there. I will give you money enough, and you never need pay it back. But I persistently refused, though I wanted to go home. But I was too proud to do so. He then said that he would give me a ticket to Upper Sandusky, within seven miles of my home, but I said no. Well, I stayed all night. In the morning, I saw that the wood box and the, and the water bucket were full. The man came in and said, Mama, we need just such a boy. Let us try to get him to stay with us. So they made me many propositions. He said, All you will need to do is to sweep out my room and clean a few glasses each morning and build the fire and look after the wood and water and go to school and share equally with Mary. He said, we lost our only boy just a year ago, a twin to Mary. Mary says that you are to take his place, as you are much like him. We have all fallen in love with you, and as Mary is the only child, when Mama and I are gone, all our property will be yours and Mary's. We have a farm in the country and just came into town to give our children a better education. When Mary graduates, we expect to return to the farm. But whatever we do, you share equally with Mary. Well, that appealed to me wonderfully, as that would give me an education and prevent me from being under the galling yoke. As I looked at, home, at my home discipline through my cornal and young eyes, I split wood that day, and as Mary came out on her way to school and kissed me, she said, You will be my brother, won't you? as I need a brother to go to school with me. I tell you, that went further than my chin. <laughs> but there was one thing that seemed to bother me, and that was the washing of all those glasses. What could that mean? By and by, the man came out and called me into dinner. Going in, I met Mary at the door, and she clasped me by the hand and said, Oh, my brother, my brother. She made me feel considerably like I was her brother. But those glasses, what did that mean? After we had eaten our dinner and Mary had gone to school, the whole thing was gone over again, preparatory to the clinching. I said, you spoke about washing some glasses and sweeping out your room. What is all this? There was a silence that could be felt even by an inexperienced boy. Finally, the man raised his head to speak, but seemed to be hesitating. He was going through a struggle that I could not diagnose. His wife soon spoke up and said, Guy? He doesn't like to mention the business he is in. He has a saloon in front, and we are all ashamed of it. Even he is, but he is in it, and it seems that he cannot get out of it without losing all that he has put into it. So then he rallied and said, Yes, Guy, we wanted to give the children a better chance than, than they could get out on the farm, and so we moved here. All times were dull, I couldn't get any work. I was idle and hunting work for about eight months. And the only thing I could find was this saloon. The man wanted to sell it out and offered it at a great bargain. And not fully realizing all that was involved in the business, I finally bought him out. We have been here three years and neither of my children has ever been in the saloon, though it is right in front of us here. Neither has my wife been in there. Well, now comes what is involved in a mother that knows me, knows and does what is right. When I left home to go to my uncle, she called me to her and took me between her limbs, raised my chin as I was on my, on my knees and said, Now, Guy, you are going away from home, away from your mother's personal care. I want you to promise your mother this one thing. Will you promise it? What is it, mother? Tears were falling between the near departure from my mother. Well, Guy, do you believe your mother would ask you to do a thing that you could not do or that would hurt you? 
This was a stunner. I said no, but what is it? A child's curiosity. Finally, I said, yes, I will do what you ask. <clears throat> and then she said, I want you to promise never to go into a saloon. Ha! Oh, well, I said, that is nothing. I'm glad it is nothing harder than that. I placed my little stress on her request at that time, for I had never been in a saloon and supposed, of course, that I never would be, so I thought that I was let off remarkably easy. But as time went on, I soon saw that Mother had a broader vision than I had. Now I told these people what Mother had made me promise. He jumped, threw his arms around me, and said, God bless that Mother of yours. You gave me her name, and I will write to her and tell her that I have a boy, and will tell her of the proposition I made you, and how you refused as a result of her covenant with you. I will adopt you if your parents will give their consent, and you never need go into that saloon, as we will soon be out anyway. You stay here and do the other chores and go to school with Mary, and be my boy until we hear from your mother and father. But don't you know, I was afraid of that saloon, as I saw then that there must be some danger in it, or mother would never have singled that out for me at that time. However, I persisted then in going up to Michigan. Now I'm coming to the lesson. The man said, if you are determined to go, as it is so cold, a friend of mine that is going to Edwardsburg will take you in the morning in his bobsled. After breakfast, the precious Mary kissed me goodbye as tears rolled down her cheeks. I never saw her after that. I got into the sleigh all covered up, and I had no overcoat or shoes, or overshoes, but an overcoat was handed to me and a pair of rubbers and some underclothings wrapped up that I did not know was for me. It was a basket of provisions also. When you get to E, go in and eat at the hotel, they said. We arrived all okay, and I went into a room that proved to be the office of the hotel. The man who brought me asked the privilege of my sitting in behind the stove to eat my dinner. So I slipped in out of the sight and took the lid off the basket, and there I saw a $5 bill. I said, they got that in there by mistake. Then the gent came out from his dinner. I said, they got this bill in here by mistake, so you please take it back. But he said, nope. That is from Mary. I saw her put it in. That is what she intended to put into a pair of furs this week. But she said that she would and could go without the furs, so this is yours. I just broke down there and cried behind the stoves. He, seeing me crying, said, Would you like to go back? If so, I will take you back and charge you nothing. I learned that he was running a, a hack, but my fare was paid by the saloon keeper. But I said, no, I will go on to. Now comes the main thing of my whole life, which prompted me to relate all this, as this book is to be on the results of prayer. I started on a 12-mile walk and had more to carry. The longing to be with my mother, the meditation, on um, the kindness and the remarkable propositions made by that kind home, the lovable Mary, as a prospective sister, as I had a sister at home when I was two years younger. All of these combined to get me in a mixed up state and had woven a web around my heart that seemed to about engulf me. I lifted up my head and I saw a large tree just several rods off from the street and I wound up there and under the tree I thought I would say, now I lay me. I thought that this would lift me out of my despondency which seemed to settle down on me like a dark heavy cloud. I started in on, now I lay. As that was the only prayer I had ever undertaken to say. But I being not quite 14 years old, supposed that was all that was necessary. But I was under the tree nearly two hours. I believe I offered the best, best prayer there that I had ever offered. For I just got to really pray and got lost in prayer. I don't know what all I prayed. But I will remember that as I progressed in this prayer that the clouds began to break. And as it seemed... There I was, being lifted up on a plane to which I had been an entire stranger. But I remember saying, O oh God, just lead me to a religious home where they pray as Mom did, uh, and where they read the Bible and they pray as Mother did. I got very happy and rose up from under that tree, most wonderfully blessed. I believe that I was then regenerated, but not knowing what regeneration is and being so young, I was kept. But Satan by, 
Uh, from realiza realizing that this was my conversation, I do not remember all that I asked or promised, but have ever since believed that all that was included that was required for my regeneration. I just ran down the road and hollered and laughed and jumped and cried. I had never experienced such inward rapture. I ran for hours under that mighty something that made me feel as I never had felt. Not supposing it to be regeneration, of course, I never testified to it, as it was such a remarked experience in my life that it stuck to me for years, and in fact, I never did get entirely away from under its influence. I look back to that tree with great reverency. I had said unto that tree, Lord, if you will take me to a religious home, I will serve you the best I know how, supposing I had to be older to get salvation. I ought to have known better than that, as I am sure that Mother never left that impression. But Satan is always well on his job, and he knows just where to get in his diabolical work. He cheated me out of what God had just given me. Well, I was at my uncle's. A niece of his spent several months there. She was from Michigan and was a friend of my uncle's old schoolmate, whom he had not seen or heard of for years. They talked much about Mr. M, who was a wealthy farmer in Michigan. I was aiming to reach him and tell him of my uncle. I got to ask about 5 p.m. and inquired the way to Mr. N's and was directed. It was about four miles off. I went and traveled until I was sure I had walked about four miles and yet had not seen no sign as I was told would appear. Finally, at 8.30 p.m., I met a man on his bobs and asked him how far it was the Bush Ridge schoolhouse he said my dear boy you are 12 or 14 miles from there no i said they said it was only four miles from s he said yes but i had gotten on the wrong road back there at the lake i was now 10 miles from the lake and if i went back to s it would take but it would be about 14 miles i had walked he asked me to go with him and stay all night as he lived only five miles from where i wanted to go but I had some of that old fear in me that some trap was being set to take me back to my uncle's. Guilty. That bell, as Brother Culp calls it, is my inner being, conscious, which kept ringing. Hmm. Well, the man said that it was only about seven miles across. As the moon shone brightly on the snow, he put me on the fence and got his bearings and sighted me through some trees that stood up so could make a straight line to the place. That dear old man worked with me for over an hour trying to get me to understand the trick of keeping the line by following certain trees. So I got to understand his principle and started. But oh, what a time as the snow was drifted over the fences and I went down three times. <sighs> Away over my head. Ah, a terrible time digging out. Then I had to go back on my track and get my line. I drudged along going over those drifts across the form, but I broke through occasionally. Finally, I got out just where I was headed for. There was a mansion right in sight, and it was larger, I guess, than any building I'd ever seen in the country. It was all lit up, three stories. I wondered what could be going on at that time in the morning, but I ventured up and saw no signs of anything to indicate that my bashfulness should cause me any fear. Planking my suitcase down at the gate, I cautiously ventured up to the porch. I heard unusual noises for that time of the night, and I stood there hungry as a bear, but trembling from head to foot. Oh, how I dared to knock at that door, but I must not stand there, for someone might come out, and I might be branded as a sneak. Stepping up to knock, I broke down and slipped off the porch and started back to see. But I said, well, having gone to all this trouble, I had better return. Maybe someone was sick. With that argument much in my favor, I slipped upon the porch and for fear that I would back out, I plunked right to the door and rapped. Someone said, come in. So I opened the door and I saw a great big fat man who looked so good and fatherly that I was quite felt at home. He said, good morning, bub. And that big bell was ringing again. He said, take that chair, bub. So I was confounded with a big great big stove it was so nice and hot i called up to it and said i am from uncle dave volhees in indiana well he brightened up and was so pleased to hear from his old school chum his wife came in and she said mama bring this boy something to eat 
I was as hungry as a bear, being too skin stingy to break the $5 bill that Mary had slipped into the basket that morning before. I had said nothing, but sat there trembled, saying to myself, If those folks don't come down, I'll eat something. But I had a terrible fear of that noise which I could hear through all the parts of the house. Finally, Mrs. N. had a nice steamy meal, and oh so tempting, all hot mashed potatoes, a rich mince pie and such tempting cake. This was all put on a little stand with a neat white cloth, and oh, the food was so inviting, so appealing to my stomach. I, I was watching it as well as is the doors. The man said, "Bub," and there it was again, "Bub, come now and set up and have something to eat." I buckled up courage and was just going to eat when there swung open a large door, and out they marched, a lady and a gentleman. Oh, such fine clothes. The lady's dress had a long silken train, and the man had such a long coattails, and everyone had flowers. I had my head pretty nearly between my knees and was as close to that stove as I dared to get, and they all stared at me when they passed through until I felt like a whipped dog, trembling fearfully when they all got out, and I said, Well, I must be going. Going, said Uncle M., where are you going? I answered the seas. He told me to sit down and eat something and then go to bed. He said that I looked tired and needed to get a good night's rest, and that if I had to go to sea, the boys would take me in the morning. Well, whom do you whom do you know at seas? He asked. I answered, no one. Well, then, he said, you sit up here. But don't you know that I was so completely scared out of the wonderful beauty and display and style and fixings that I could not stay and walked out and started down to sea. Four miles and oh, so hungry and tired. By and by, about 4 a.m., I arrived at sea. There I was, but the girl who had been at my uncle's lived nine miles from there, so I started for the place. God was on my track, and though I had made what seemed terrible blunders, Yet I believe all was in accordance with his will and order that he might answer the prayer that I made under the tree the day before. While I was trudging down the sidewalk all covered with snow, I soon heard some sleigh bells. I stopped and listened. What could that mean at that time of day? Soon the sled overtook me and the man said, Good morning, bub. There was that name again. He asked where I was going. Going to D. What are you going there for? To get work, I answered. Well... You are a pretty smart boy to go out hunting work this time of the year and morning. You come here and get in my bob and go home with me, and then if you want to go to D, I will help you. Somehow I felt my fear and timidity leaving under the soft, mellow voice and the entreaties of this man. He drove up to the walk, and I jumped in with my suitcase. We only had a mile to drive. The man took me up to the well-lighted and warm kitchen, and there a sweet-faced woman was sitting waiting for her husband who had been in South Bend, Indiana with a load of black walnuts for the Singer Sewing Machine Company. Yeah, and that was why he was getting home at that hour of the morning. He said, Well, Em, here's our boy. She jumped up and took hold of my hands and rubbed them and kissed me. She got some hot tea water and rubbed me, washed me, and then sat me down on the well-filled table. She hauled out one dish after another from that warm oven and sat them on the table steam. Oh, I will never forget her motherly actions towards me that morning, that fine table so temptingly spread, and how I did wait into those fine delicacies. It seemed that I had lost all my bashfulness, but I must not fail to tell you that of the blessing that that man asked as we sat down to that table. He thanked God for sparing his life, allowing no accidents on the trip, for getting so much money for his load, and last but not least, for picking a little boy. And oh, he just talked to Jesus there until he had me crying. He said, Amen. And his wife took up her clean napkin and wiped the tears all away and kissed me again and said, There now, have some of this nice fried chicken and some of those warm mashed potatoes and some of this gravy. And soon she had me so hypnotized I just ate and ate. After breakfast, he took down the well-worn Bible and read the 14th chapter of John. I was so wonderfully impressed that I investigated as to where it was. And that chapter had been a great blessing to me. And I have preached holiness as a second work of grace from that notable chapter until many have been brought into the sanctifying grace through it. So as you say, 
Here in the, is the answer to my prayer that I offered under that tree. As God had brought me into a religious home and the home of a stone Methodist at that, the same as I had been brought up in, soon I gave God my heart in such a way that I knew I had my salvation. End of chapter 1.